Welcome to Become Famous Podcast, the ultimate destination for achieving fame in your industry. Join us for discussions as we uncover the strategies and secrets to becoming known, navigating cancel culture, and staying authentic. Stay tuned because here at Become Famous, the journey to fame begins now. Well, welcome to Become Famous uh, podcast. I'm really excited to have Matt Walker. I got to meet him in a network and he is a psychologist and an international mountain guide and he combines the two to heal men's hearts. And I know I'm not saying it the way you want to do, but that's how I (laughs) take it. I take it from and I'm really excited because you're bringing in the male adventure part and then yet you're couching it into something they probably need to find a way so that they can advert their midlife crisis. So welcome, Matt. Thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. So how did you combine those two? I mean, you're a psychologist, and then how did you figure out, I can use these two to help men? Well, I actually started as a mountain guide. So I've been guiding all over the world on eight, seven continents, each continent, um, for I guess the better part of a little more than 25 years now. And... Um, what I realized in doing that work was that there were individuals that were repeatedly coming on these expeditions that were going out to climb, um, that were seeking something larger than themselves. There was some pain, challenge, difficulty in their life, and they had chosen um, an objective, a mountain, some sort of something big and substantial to pour their time and energy into to get fit, to get healthy, uh, to focus on because there were significant challenges, pains, uncertainty in their life. And it gave them a a direction and an outlet. And they'd go on these climbs, they'd go on these trips and they would be focused. They'd be fully immersed in that experience. Um, it, there's a sense of, of deep camaraderie and relationship that forms on those experiences. And th- you also, the mountains teach you in a way that, you know, what you put out is what you, you get back. So um, it's unrelenting in its message. Um, and people would leave these expeditions and climbs feeling incredible fulfillment and reward for their effort and time and, and presence. And by the time they got home, that feeling would slowly dissipate over time and they'd return back to their previous routines, their habits, the challenges, the difficulties, the mindsets they had prior to the experience. And then they come back again in another year to do it again, to get, to get that bump back of clarity and, and sense of purpose. So they were on this cycle and I was watching this occur over the years. And I realized there's got to be a better way to do this. There has to be a better way to serve, um, to serve people that are seeking something greater than themselves, seeking some kind of solution, some kind of purpose. Um, and that's where I decided to take some time off from climbing. I've um, got a master's in psychology and then to come back into the climbing environment and, and bring these two worlds together. You know, before we bring the worlds together, I have so many friends that love mountaineering. So they've done mm. Kilimanjaro. They have done the um, the Elbrus in mm-hmm. Russia. Uh, they've done the base camp on Mount Everest. They've yeah. done the the highest mountain in South America, which I always forget the name of. And Aconcagua. Just, Aconcagua, yes, Aconcagua, yeah. and and. They're so addicted to it. And I think it's this part of themselves challenging them to the to the greatest heights or edge of themselves, right? I mean, going Aconcagua, like my friend was like almost almost died, right? It's like this, you're so close to death in many ways. And then there's another mountain, not Kilimanjaro, but there's another mountain, maybe you can help me, in Africa that's very, that's the second highest. Mount Kenya. There's awesome. another one. There's another one. Anyway, uh, okay. Is it, but uh, it's, it's close. But anyways, my friends were there and they were just giving these examples. And I got to go to a movie with them, watching how people go up to Kilimanjaro and mm-hmm. they just pass away and die. And, and this amazing risk you take on this edge. Um, where have you been and how did you get into mountaineering? 
Yeah. Well, before I answer that question, I want to talk about a topic that you just brought in, which is um, why is such like why people do what? Why why do we even do this right now? Or why go on these expeditions? Why like why? where is the addiction? Why, why does that happen? Um, and it's an addiction of suffering. And, I mean, it's not like you're you're cold. Well. Up. It is, but the su- but that's part of it is that um, the suffering is temporary, mm-hmm. and I think so. Here's my take on that: um, our lives right now, when our you know, like if we look at Maslow's kind of hierarchy of needs, if if our basic needs are met with structure, food, um, heat, clothing, and and when those needs are met, which then the next level is uh, we sit to, you know, we reach out for a sense of purpose, but when our needs are met with such ease Mm -hmm. as our world operates today, um, we become incredibly complacent and we also become um, soft to challenge and difficulty and discomfort so that the slightest discomfort in our lives right now, um, we can adjust, you know, with little micro turns, like, Oh, I'm a little bit cold. So put a, put just the right layer on for, to, for my body to be right, just the right temperature. Um, I'm craving this food. I can, get, I can go out and get specifically the exact food that I want at that moment. Um, we are able to customize our lives to the nth degree, which is amazing. And it, 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 I mean, it's super powerful that we can actually do that at this stage in our uh, uh, civilization. But the flip side of that is that we, we also are rapidly losing our ability to be in discomfort um, and to be able to move through moments of suffering, not longevity of suffering, but moments of suffering. And so these climbs offer us to like pare down to just our base needs. You know, you can only carry what's in your backpack. So you don't get to carry 10 layers of clothing. You get three or four. Um, the food that you're having for dinner that night is the food you're having, period. Um, you know, your shelter is very basic. And then there's suffering. You know, you're not going to have the right tool and the right piece of equipment and the right temperature and weather at any given moment. You can't adjust for that. You just have to, to work with what is. And when we expand that, um, skill to be able to work with what is and, and, and expand our ability to be in discomfort and really identify what suffering truly is. It then replicates into our own lives where we are so much more capable of working through challenge and difficulty and being able to support others in challenge as opposed to just being turned inward to you know, to kind of fine tune our own experience. So I, have, I think I part of the really quick there. I got to interject. Yeah. Yeah, please. Because, I know I, I get because on the mountain. No, please. because the mountaineering, I'm really, I'm really what's interesting because I'm from Norway and in Norway, the mountains are part of us. Like we, we, mm-hmm. I've gone skiing, I've gone hiking. And, and when you talk about going out in the mountains, we are like way ahead of, of Americans in the sense of it being so sure. much part of our lives. But it was fascinating because when I was hiking, when I was young and I came back to the U at Norway to go hiking Hiking in itself has gotten comfortable. Like I mm. came on my hiking trip, the, the largest mountain in Norway, I was doing that like th- four years ago. I brought with me just my yoga mat to sleep on, but now you can get these like little nice mattresses, right? You can get, oh yeah. so, so society of comfort. And I was laughing at, my friends were laughing at me for only using the yoga. And they're like, you should have had the blown up. I was like, well, this is what I was brought up on, right? But so it's interesting how the comfort of life has even come in to mountaineering. Absolutely. I mean, the, the, yeah, you go to a mountaineering shop right now and the, the level of comfort is, that you can dial in is, is no. mind blowing compared to where it was 10, 15 years, 20 years ago. It really is. Um, the, yes, the, the, the piece that is never changing though, which I is, is that the mountain and nature doesn't care. It's, it's, it, you know, it, it has no compassion. It has no, uh, it just doesn't care. So you can wow. make these adjustments, but if you don't 
work with what is, if you try and fight that, fight the unfightable, <laughs> um, you're going to lose every time. So there has to be this ability to be able to work with what is. Um, and I, I see that frequently, actually, in the, in the high mountain environment where um, people have a sense of an expectation or entitlement that, uh, you know, I, I, I set aside this time. I put this it, resources into it, time and money and energy. Um, I, sh- I should or I, the, I should be able to go to the summit. It's like, well, we we're just dealt the hand that we're dealt. And um, I mean, oftentimes I actually think the best learning are on those expeditions that are the most difficult, that don't have the, the romantic uh, summit photo um, that are really, the, you know, when people have to come back and say, oh, I didn't summit X, Y, Z, and here's why, um, that's a much more interesting introspective story and experience than um, having everything become turnkey and getting your summit shot coming home and talking about it at a cocktail party. So, yeah, it's um, interesting you say yeah. that because my friend from Acon- when he went up Aconcagua, half of the people, I think it was almost 75% of the people were not able to make it and they were mm-hmm. so frustrated. And, but you're right. It's interesting, you know, the person that didn't make it, but the people that didn't, right? Yeah, it's incredibly humbling. I talk about this. So, um, I have a kind of a foundation that I, how I approach adventure and then how I, mm-hmm relay that to our personal lives. Um, and it's what I call the five elements of adventure, which are a high endeavor, an uncertain outcome, total commitment, tolerance for adversity, and great companionship. So you want all five of those pieces to be present, not just in a physical mountain climbing experience, but also in the adventures of our lives, You know, whether it's our the work that we do, our, our personal relationship, our most sig- significant partnerships, how we raise our kids, those things are, are crucial. So this idea of uncertain outcome, it, if the outcome is locked in and turnkey, it, it loses its meaning. It becomes like a, an amusement park ride that is maybe exhilarating and fun and kind of lights you up for a little bit, but then it just dissipates. It's like fast food, you know, it just kind of, it's gone. So that piece of uncertainty is absolutely crucial. So having a 50% success rate to the summit, that's what gives that mountain the power that it has. And uh, that's what makes it, you know, such an epic experience to go climb that mountain because it is unrelenting there. But you know, it's interesting when you say that about uncertainty. I think in society today, we are latching on a lot of people on this whole manifesting. Oh, if I just manifest myself, I can manifest myself up the mountain. Oh, I can manifest all this money. Mm. All these miracles can happen to me. And and I do believe in miracles and I believe in that component. But yet, Yet I believe in that sense of the uncertainty that we're talking about. And how do you uh, how do you how do you deal with that? Or how do what do you think about that? Sorry, I don't know why. That yeah, was. so I think that um, so I, I, I'll, I'll actually frame it in the uh, when I look when I think about the third element, which is total commitment. So um, if you aren't open to influence and open to possibility and open to new information. Mm-hmm then going from point A to point B is incredibly difficult. So if you starting from A and you want to get to B, let's just use the Aconcagua example mm-hmm. to start a base camp. You want to go to the summit of Aconcagua, A to B. You've got a schedule lined up. Um, if you are dogmatic and strict on how that's going to go, it's going to be fraught with difficulty and challenge. If you have a specific outcome as to how you want to approach parenting, A to B, you want your child to learn X, Y, Z along the way, you're going to receive a different type of experience as a result if you hold that dogmatic perspective. Being open to influence and new information allows us to be fluid and change along the way, which allows us to then be able to reach our goal with significantly more ease and joy and pleasure satisfaction. So when you come back to the manifestation piece, I link that to being open to influence and open to possibility as opposed to being locked down. So do we manifest X, Y, Z occurring? I am not of the belief that we do, but I believe in the process of manifestation or prayer or, um, meditation as a vehicle, as a way of being able to 
step outside of ourselves and see things from a new perspective, which then influences and informs how we choose to move forward. To handle the mountain. Yeah. Of our lives. Whatever the mountain, whether it's a literal mountain or a metaphorical. Wow. Yeah. So I want to just take a step back. So how did you get into mountaineering? Because that's, that's really a rare, I'm not, not many people do it. So, and at such a high level that you did. Yeah. And still do. Uh, I still and climb still do. Yes. quite a bit. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, my backstory in, in climbing was uh, I was in high school. I grew up in, in New Jersey, just outside of Manhattan. And um, I, I'm from New Jersey. In, oh, I was born in Jersey. Where, where are you from in Jersey? Oh, yeah. Morristown. No, I'm from Caldwell. Wow. Look at that. I was yeah. born in, I was born in orange, um, brought up in Norway, but lived part of my times in Caldwell. Sorry. I just was like so excited when you said Jersey. No, same, same. <laughs> I mean, like how funny, right? Same neck of the woods, same like 10 square mile area. Uh, yes. Yeah. So, yeah. So, you know, that region, um, mm -hmm. not the birthplace of, uh, North American mountaineering. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> And uh, I took a, a climbing course um, in the winter of my junior year of high school. And that was through a friend that made a recommendation, took the course, um, got just hooked on it. And the part, there was, the part that really hooked me in was um, I had never done something that demanded so much presence. And I'd never done something that I couldn't just um, eject out of at a given moment, you know, like playing sports around the sports field. Yeah. I learned these skills and, and athleticism, but I could always go home at the end of the day or I could always walk off the field. And on this climbing program uh, where we were in the mountains for eight days in the winter, you couldn't just throw the, throw in the towel and leave. Um, so it was the first time where I really felt one what it felt like to hit, hit, up, hit up against a wall physically and mentally and emotionally and then pass through that to realize that my strength of character was greater than what I had thought it was going to be. So that was profound. Um, and that I was surrounded by other people that were supporting each other. We were doing the same thing together. I think there was 10 or 12 of us on the trip. So I finished that trip and was instantly hooked by that experience. Um, to be in relationship with people in a way that I had never been in before with trust and clear communication and challenge. And then, um, yes. Yeah, so from there I went to undergrad in Washington state and dove straight into climbing. And I, uh, I did graduate with, from college undergrad, not super, not in a super strong way, but I did graduate. Um, uh, but I spent way more time in the mountains than I did in the classroom and use that. And then that, it just, exploded from there in terms of opportunity and possibility and, and working in the mountain industry. So I've had the chance to work in the climbing industry since I was about 20, yeah, 2021. Uh, yeah. So what mountain has been your greatest challenge? Oh, um, the big Moby Dick. Do you have a Moby Dick? Mountain? Yeah, I have. A, <laughs> I've got one that I have returned to multiple times. Mm. Um, with success and with failure, uh, it's called the Moose's Tooth. It's in the Alaska Range, uh, just outside of. It's in Denali National Park, um, and it's an incredibly large, sheer, steep mountain um, on mm. every side. And the routes up it are incredibly technical and, and fickle too. Like sometimes mm. the ice climbing forms well, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes the snow conditions aren't safe. Um, and it is uh, a massive, massive mountain that has granted me access to the top a couple of times. And it has also shut me down um, multiple times. And, uh, and when it shuts you down, it does so with a wallop. So um, I think that mountain has probably made the most significant impact um, in my life, actually, the amount of time and the experiences I've had there. What yeah. impact? Like, so if you're listening to the way. podcast... Google the moose's tooth uh, in Alaska. We'll put in the show notes. It. Yeah, it's a it we'll is a very steep, dramatic mountain. What what takeaways did you have from that? Like, if you said it changed you, what was it about that mountain? Well, yeah, I'll, I'll share the first expedition I, I went there. Um, the very first time I went there, 
I think we, so you fly in to, on the glacier, on a, on a, on a, on a plane and uh, land on the glacier. You take your duffel bags out. Um, the plane t- t- takes off, turns around, takes off down the run, down the runway, which is just compact snow and ice. Um, and it is just dead silent. There's no one there. It's just myself and the other person, the other climber I'm with. And uh, it was shocking the solitude and how remote we were and how massive this, these mountains were. I mean, just towering above us. That was incredibly, incredibly intimidating to realize like we are really hanging it out in this, this range and there's, there's no one that can help you. And um, you're completely isolated. Um, you know, and so, one in just like how you function and then also like being out and taking risk uh, in the climbing environment. So we moved uh, from base camp, we moved up to another camp and settled in. And then we had a plan as to how to climb the mountain. And then the next day a storm rolls in and I don't think the storm really abated for about 14 days. So we got one day of clear weather where we were out of the tent and kind of took in some sun and then another storm came in. So we essentially sat in our tent for about 14 days, um, shoveling snow and just in the tent, cooking food, sitting there, sleeping, reading, sleep, and just on repeat. And by the time the weather shifted, we still had about another week's worth of food. But at that point, we were so tired from doing nothing and just being in that environment, just with nothing like the, the lethargy of it. And we were so afraid. I mean, that was the one thing I really remember is being like, I am too afraid of this mountain to actually climb at this point, having watched the whole thing. Um, so that, that was really a powerful, even though it was young in my career, it was a really powerful experience to one, put all this time and energy into it, throw myself at it, like just train, focus, and then arrive and then just sit in a tent for two weeks. Um, and then to realize like, oh, a lot of my lethargy and depression and it it was one tied to the sitting in a tent for two weeks, which is not an easy thing to do. Um, but also I was, I was really, really afraid. And, um, and so then exiting and looking at that, acknowledging that that was a massive, you know, that was a massive part of it for me. So good, good learning. People face their fears. You help men face their fears. I, think I, I do. Combined. And that's what's so interesting is, um, you found a way to help them through this mountain experience. So what do you do with the five points that you have as they go? Like you've like a, you got several, like got a small group, you got one-on-one. How do you meet them? So they advert this crisis. middle. Uh, yeah. Middle so crisis? one of the, you know, just to, I'll, I'll start with the averting the fears. Um, oftentimes we have patterns of self-sabotage that we don't even realize we are feeding our fears and keeping that mm. narrative going. Um, so I'll use uh, heights as an example. So pe- some people are afraid of, you know, they're afraid of heights, but what they're really afraid of is falling. They're afraid of getting hurt. Um, but their, mm. their mind will hijack that and, uh, and assign that fear as fear of heights. And so what goes with the fear of heights is now I'm just, I'm a, as a result of that, what I've determined is my fear of heights. I've also determined I'm just not going to engage in this experience because engaging in that creates this sense of fear. So I'm just blocking myself off from that experience altogether. Um, so whether it's fear of heights, um, I often see people with a fear of commitment. So wanting to, and the commitment is I want to know all the variables and I want to control all the variables and then I'll make a decision as to what I'm going to do next which as we all know, that's not actually how the world operates. We can't control the uncontrollable. And so that's a piece that comes up as a fear that, that is easily demonstrated and managed in a mountain environment. Um, So there, there is the, it's the, not just a facing of fear, but it's also kind of pulling it back a couple layers to recognize what is the fear and why. Um, And, that comes up in so many different ways. And the mountain experience is a metaphor, 
but the real work is in applying it to our personal lives and into our professional space. And that's where the, the coaching piece comes in. So it could be, um, I, I run an online group that meets for eight weeks and we actually never go out in the mountains together at all. That's not a component of the program. Um, instead it's about acknowledging what is something that they have always wanted determining something that I call it a BFG, a big fucking goal. What's something they've always wanted, but have been afraid to do for whatever reason. And then we parse that into sections and we actually work that as a group for each of the men. And there's accountability in that process. So in a short version of that, we can actually, without even going out into the mountains, we can still apply the learning into uh, today's space. So there's everything from that to individual coaching where we really do customize an adventure and go out into the mountains and create an experience that matches where they're at. Um, I often hear people say, Oh, I, I don't know how to climb. So I, I you know, I, or, I'm afraid of heights. I'm like, well, if you can climb a ladder on the side of a, of a house, then, then you can go rock climbing, you can go mountaineering and we can, I can teach you the rest. We can, we can go over all the other pieces, but, um, if you have the ability to climb a flight of stairs or climb up a ladder, then you can, you can absolutely do these other experiences. So, so there's custom work, although, you know, that's, that's everything from the Himalaya to Kilimanjaro to stuff in the North America to, you know, an eight week online program that doesn't actually go in the mountains at all, but uses that uh, experience as, uh, as fuel. Wow. So when you coach these men, um, what do you feel is their biggest barrier? Uh, and it might just be fear or is there certain hmm. components around uh, that's particular that you see in the men that you coach? Yeah, I would say there's two things and these two things actually may be the same thing. Um, there is denial mm. and fear of voice. Fear of voice. What's that? Fear of voice, afraid of their own voice. Oh, okay. So wow. feeling disempowered of their own voice mm. and denial. And then, and so I'll, let me, I'll speak to denial first. Denial comes up as, um, this problem is not that bad. Mm. This issue is not that big a deal. Um, I can deal with this. I bootstrapped my way through this already. I can continue to do that. Um, I, you know, I, I'm accustomed to solving problems on my own. I'll just, I will solve this problem as well. And what I see with the denial piece is, um, a man will reflect back to me as to what's going on in their life. And if I literally will use the same words back to him, he'll say, well, no, 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 that not that it's not that big a deal. So there's a dampening, um, of their own experience that, that what they are experiencing in the world isn't really that bad or isn't worthy of larger effort to solve. And so what ends up happening frequently is that instead of preemptively working with the challenge or difficulty or pain, it just grows and grows on its own until it becomes a real issue and a real problem. And that's where people are like, yeah, I need help. So one of the things I would love to support men to do is to come forward sooner before right before big massive crisis in their life and the fear of voice piece comes up with um feeling a need for permission to show up in the world the way they want to show up there's a level of entrainment belief pattern that their voice their desire their goals um is secondary as an adult that things they wanted as a kid or wanted in adolescence or in their twenties um, that is no longer accessible to them, that they need to show up in a very specific certain way. That's not necessarily in alignment with who they are. And that disconnect creates a massive amount of pain and, um, and misalignment. And so, and then when you're misaligned, you know, that's where, real sideways behavior occurs. Things come out sideways because you're feeling so disjointed. So I would say those are the two things is like not feeling empowered or comfortable to claim what it is that they want, how they want to live their lives. Um, and feeling the sense of, uh, 
of denial that, uh, that the problem or the challenge actually deserves attention. What do you think that is? Uh, do you think it's because we are putting such expectations on a man that we, I never, like, the permission thing is really interesting because I was talking to Neil earlier and he was saying the same thing uh, in the sense, in a different way. But it seems like, and, and I agree, there is this sense of the permission to go somewhere. And what is it about society and men in general? And then the, the fear of their voice is it that their parents have put them in a box that they feel like they have to abide by their parents, abide by society and, Oh, you man, you're supposed to be strong and stuff like what, what is it about yeah. that? I think there's a couple of things. I think there's a cultural norm. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that's, you know, that is, a, I, th I think there's a cultural norm that is a very challenging, especially today in today's environment, it's very challenging to, um, address that cultural norm um, because there are other so many there are other behaviors that men um, have historically done that are is, is unacceptable. So um, adjusting that adjusting a piece of that just feels really challenging right now. What kind like of a, norms are you thinking about? What kind of cultural norms are you particularly thinking about? I, I'm thinking about well in terms of what. Uh, that I believe specifically the um, nurture, protector, provider norm, mm -hmm. and that in that space, there, which is also a, I, th I believe that's an innate aspect um, in men, in fathers, to want to really embody that. While at the same time, there's a tendency to throw the baby out with the bathwater. That has to be, it's either yes or no. It's binary. You can't have both. You can't truly be a provider and be nurturing and um, a protector of relationship and holding space for that while also indulging in your own experiences in the world. That some There's an honor to some level of sacrifice. Oh, and wow. okay that that the result of that is in dampening one's own voice. But the reality is, is that that just builds resentment and um, mistrust. And frankly, it also like, that's what also creates, you know, the, the type of sideways behaviors, whether it's through acting out in relationship, um, overspending addiction, um, hiding behaviors, that kind of thing, because there's a desire to, that isn't being met. And so it comes out in some sideways, uh, secretive way, as opposed to really acknowledging and, and engaging with what is and what's desired. So there's a component to it that um, it's, it's almost like a create, like if, if we dampen down the possibility of creative engagement, creative release, here, you know, um, engaging in the world that that gives an individual meaning, um, that energy is going to come out somewhere else, and it usually comes out pretty poorly. I use the example of like the the man who goes through the midlife crisis and buys himself a sports car. It's like th basically what he's in doing that. What he's doing is he's like, I've got the money, so I want to have the freedom to spend my money the way I want to spend it. Um, I'm going to tap into the 25 year old version of me or even younger, the 16 year old version of me. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to do it on my terms and I'm going to do it in my way. And, you know, you can look from the side and watch that and, and see, you know, what a parody that is. But what I see is also just the expression of an individual who's not able to, um, who has not felt the ability to, step into their own power and their own freedom and their own expression for decades or years at a time. And then it just comes out in some really obvious sideways manner, as opposed to um, the individual who's, who's able to voice and acknowledge that their needs aren't being met. And so they're going to seek it out in a different way in partnership with others and in clarity, as opposed to just like the knee jerk 180 degree response. So how can, a spouse, 
Mm-hmm. How can a sister like me, because I have two brothers in that kind of situation, how can yeah. a brother, how can a sister, how can a spouse, how can friends make room for it? And what is it that society needs to do? And is society making more room for the man to find his voice? Or do you feel like it's being contracted right now? No, no, I think it is expanding. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I would say the, the most, the, I, I guess, I'm thinking about you as a sister, like what would be the most impactful way to go about that? Mm -hmm. And I think it would be twofold. I think one, it would be witnessing and acknowledging Mm -hmm. and then asking curious questions. So the witnessing and acknowledging would be when you do have a moment to actually sit and connect is to acknowledge, I see this, I see you, I see how much you've given, I see how you show up for others. And so it's that, recognition and gratitude to say, I know that it's not easy. And I just want to acknowledge like you are, you're, you're doing the right thing. Mm. And to, to be, you know, that it's not just a given, um, and that you're making those choices to, to do that. And the second piece would be like, and I'm concerned because you always give and you're always, so And so then you're saying, so what is it that you're not giving to yourself? What is it that you have wanted that you're denying? And just to open up the conversation. So you you can't force feed anyone through this, but what you're doing is you're creating a relationship where you're then able to, that person feels empowered to use their voice and share. And depending on their level of comfort, Uh, depending on their level of comfort in a conversation like this, it may take six conversations like that. (laughs) And it could take one. But. but it's interesting you say that because I have done the first part and it was, and he, one of my brothers was just totally flabbergasted by me saying that. And it was like, he kept remembering it. He kept telling, he even told my mom about it. I was like, mm-hmm. and, 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 but what I haven't done, and I think that's a really good point is part two. How mm. are you going to take care of you? Right. Because he is such a citizen yeah. and, and good. Uh, and you want him. And, and it's very fascinating. You say that because I think I, not just with my brother, but with friends of mine, I've got good male friends. Like, what are you doing to take care of you? I think that's, that's well, I, I did an, exa- I did a, a, wow. an exercise in my men's group that I run uh, this past week where I had men for five minutes straight do a stream of conscious exercise where they had to continue writing the entire time. And it, they had to start each sentence with, I want, and it was, um, I want X, Y, Z. I want X, Y, Z. So they kept going, kept going, kept going. These long lists of things that they, they had never given voice to, the things that they want for themselves and their life, for their families, to just express that. Um, and then we use that as a tool for our, the, you know, for our program. But it was, it was really powerful to have people read these lists and be like, wow, we all want the same things. I also want to hit on this, your brother's reaction for a second because I think there's there's something so powerful here that I'm not sure um, is really collectively acknowledged. Um, so there's a kind of a trope in men's dating that men deeply, deeply remember the one time a woman asked them out or the one time a woman gave them a random compliment Mm -hmm. and they'll reference that. I mean, it could be years in the past. Like that's how infrequent those types of experiences are. So I can remember a woman asking me out when I was 22, exactly where I was. And I don't, I don't think a woman has gone out of her, like individually gone out of her way to do that unprompted, no connection whatsoever. I think that might be the only time. And I remember specifically what she looked like and where we were and like what an imprint that made. And so if I think about your brother and him receiving that, it's like those, that type of in, inquiry isn't frequent from is, is infrequent in men's lives. And it really does make an impact, which is why he would have shared it with your mom. You know, it's so fascinating that you're saying this because when I'm talking to you now as a woman, we always look at the white man's privilege. Right. Mm-hmm. And and I think there's also a white man's burden. And we talk about that a lot in politics, like the white, the bird, the white man's burden. But I think there's an individual male white burden that I'm realizing just now talking to you is the burden of being the caretaker, burden of being the privileged one. You know, you have 
at least in workforce, I've been more discriminated against the male. But in the sense, having that privilege, there has been a cost to it. And the cost, what I'm talking to you is, you're putting that so much on a pedestal that you've lost your voice or many lose their voice. And then when they're feeling like they're the caretaker through lives, like I've seen friends of mine get divorced, they feel this pressure, 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 and they don't feel like they can communicate it to the people around them. And that's, and I think that's a real burden that we haven't really as a society acknowledged that men face. Yeah. And I'm, I mean, and I'll be the first to say it. I don't know when is an appropriate time to acknowledge that because the trespasses that white men have created in the world are real and significant. And there is this side effect where if you actually detach from the collective of the white male and look at each one as an individual person, that's where you will see the wound, which is, yes, I, I, cause I'm part of this class. I am part of this group that has done significant damage to the world and continues to do so. And I'm also an individual that is separate from that. And so the pain of that experience, um, each individual man also experiences. And so when you, when you meet your brother there and you say that you see him and you see this thing, it may be the first time anyone has ever said that to him. Yeah, I was so, surprised. I think it was. Yeah. And I think it was very, very surprising to me because I, and I think uh, I've said it several times, but it was like this one time really hit him. And he told, told his wife, he told his mom, and it was just like this really sense of, wow, we don't give enough compliments to people in life. We don't give. And I think a lot of times, uh, at least for me, you just think that the man knows because he is the leader. And it's like with me, like being a leader of a business and so forth. Sometimes I crave so much that someone will see my accomplishments, right? And that's why you do mm-hmm. coaches and people. I guess I appreciate I have Neil as a coach who's a mutual friend of ours because he's like, he sees me, which other people are not seeing. And we all crave right. that, that, that permission and having someone witnessing who we are. Yeah. I mean, like I was just talking about earlier with the, I want list. Um, you know, we all want the same things. Yeah. We just want to be, we want to be acknowledged. We want to be seen and acknowledged um, at a base level. Yeah. It's very yeah. powerful. It is. So, it is. It's incredibly. It's incredibly simple. Yeah. But unbelievably complex in how we go about as humans engaging with that. Right. We make it so complex and difficult and challenging when it really is a very simple desired experience. But you're so, creating an experience for them to to give that through your men's group and stuff like that. Correct. Yeah. Um, that, yeah, that is exactly what that is. It's a, it's a space to be seen, to be worked through these topics, um, to be witnessed, and also to mentor and mentee others who have come before and others that are going through situations that are similar. Because there's only so many variations of the human experience. Um, but to not do it in isolation is in, insanely healing. It is, it's really powerful and quick, too. I think that's the other piece that's, as, I, as a practitioner in this space, that's the thing I, I'm so struck by is how quickly healing can take place. And how, oh, you know, how, how quickly it, it takes place and how, how empowering it is. That's good because you always think that it's not going to take quickly. And maybe it's because if you go to a psychologist on the one-on-one, you're not getting the witness. Maybe with your group, with the, the nature, the mountaineering, the, the collective with your men's group, that being seen by more, so it's not just the person that you've paid to be there. Maybe there's some something in yeah. there. Yeah. I think it's twofold. I think there is the camaraderie of the experience. Mm-hmm. Um, and the second is that, you know, in a typical psychotherapist situation, it's very cognitive. You're in your head the whole time. You're processing. Yeah. And mm-hmm. the work that I'm doing is, is, is holding both at the same time. So there is the sharing processing aspect. But to be, to be totally frank, like 
men have a hard time staying in that space for very long, myself included. Like I can dip into it, but then I need to get out of there because it's just too much. If I'm in my head too much, then I, I really get stuck. Mm-hmm. So the, the work is to hold both, to also be doing uh, experiential ex- exercises, activities, movement, um, and combining those things together. And that's, I think that's for men, incredibly healing to have, to be able to dip in and out of that and not be just in your head the whole time. So it's like somatic healing. Correct. Getting through the muscles yeah. and everything. With nature. Wow. Yeah. With nature. But how do you do that when you're in the, in the group of the groups that's on the, on the call? Do you get them out? Y- yeah. So give them instructions or how, because then I, I was just thinking it's a cognitive thing, but what you're saying is you're marrying the two. So how do you do that on zoom? <laughs> Right. Well, there's exercises and activities that are done in between. Yeah. So okay. there's directives with like, okay, so here's this exercise, um, you know, over the next 10 days, you, you know, X, Y, Z to go out in nature, to go and do this thing, to challenge yourself here. Um, and then you're set up with an accountability partner and then you bring that to the group. So it's a little bit of, of all of those things. Um, and I'll just like, I'll give an example. We were, since we were just talking about gratitude and appreciation, um, one of the activities that we like we just did this last call was to reach out and clean clean up clean up some kind of a mess that you have out in the world some sort of some sort of mess that is energetically challenging for you whether it's with a sibling or a family member or uh, you know it's a financial thing that needs to be cleaned up or something but taking ownership of your side and so the act, there's an activity and exercise in actually not just thinking your way through it but then going out and doing that that very thing that that you want to create for yourself. So it's going to be a balance of activity, workshop, um, exercises with the cognitive aspect as well. Wow. I wish I was a man that could be part of that group. (laughs) (laughs) That sounds fantastic. Well, we are coming to a close and I really want to say thank you so much. Um, One last advice and then I have a sec, the last question, but Mm. one advice, how do you, how does a man or even women, how do they find a place? What are your criteria to find that space to be seen and to have permission? Because we do need mm-hmm. coaches. We do need people outside. How? What are some criteria that you would have someone look to if they are right now saying, hmm, I really like what Matt's saying? Yeah. I, I think the very – I guess the, the first thing I would look at is – um, what type of experience do you want to have? Like what's, what, what's your goal and intention? So is your goal and intention, I need to unplug, I need digital detox, um, I need physical space, I need to rest. You know, then that's going to point you in a direction towards a retreat or a program that's, that's directed that way. Um, you know, or is it actually I really need a community and I, I am craving community, I'm craving um, movement. So that'll point you in a direction. And then, you know, the next questions are time. How much time do you have? Do you want to do a weekend? Do you want to do two weeks? Do you want to do something that's six months? Um, and, and one piece I think that, that people, uh, that I really encourage people to consider is what is a group size that feels good to them? Do you thrive in a group of 40 people or do you thrive in a group of six and, uh, and use that as, as a, a piece of information in making those choices. Um, I would then actually reach out to someone who's that you, you know, what you can Google search, find something and then reach out, talk to the facilitator and use it as an interview process um, to then gain more information because you may not be a, a right, the, that might not be the right fit for you, but they are likely going to know other practitioners or facilitators that can support your other coaches. So, I, I take calls all the time from individuals that are thinking, oh, I want to climb this or I've got this life goal and how do I go about this? And we do a 30-minute call and, um, you know, it's complimentary. It's no charge. It's just a 30-minute oh, intake call. And then the, they may not be, the, we may not be the right fit at all. And that's actually mm-hmm. fantastic because then I can say, hey, I think you may want to reach out to these three people. They offer something that I think is going to be an excellent fit for you. Um, and then it's just in service and support of, of healing and, and, and wellness. So yeah. I would say if there's one piece of criteria, I would say is 
um, step away from the screen and get on the phone and ask, and have the conversations with people and ask questions and then ask for referrals and other possibilities and ideas if it doesn't line up. That's fantastic. So my last question is, what do you want to become known for? So um, like at the mm. end of your life, um, but I'm, I'm giving you two two tracks. You have your personal okay. and then you have your professional so that you don't have to feel like I have to mesh this one thing. But what is your personal and your mm. professional? What would you want to be known for? What I want to be known for? Um, hmm. I want to be known for supporting the health and wellness of men mm -hmm. to live their lives fully engaged to create experiences that shift people's lives mm -hmm. and the learning and impression that is made in those experiences gives them an opportunity to, to show up in service and in presence for their um, family in ways mm -hmm. that um, was unavailable previously. Mm -hmm. yeah. I actually, if I, if I take that back a little bit further and just kind of really think about it, um, I want to support men um, who are on, who by the time they are on their deathbed have lived a life without regret. Mm, that's beautiful. Yeah. Wow. That's beautiful. That's a great so, question. Thank you. I've never voiced that before. So, so thank you. That's, that's powerful. So what we will do now is I'll put all of your links in the show notes, probably if it's okay to put the call so people can reach out to you. Yeah. And I just want to say, thank you. This was such a powerful, I hope I can bring you back. I love to I'd love to. more into it because I just feel like you have a sense of understanding relationship. And we haven't even tapped into a lot of the stuff I wanted to talk about was like relationship and AI and the whole society. So I hope mm -hmm. I can bring you back because oh, I'd love to come back. Yeah. This is such a powerful conversation. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Become Famous Podcast. If you like what you heard, please subscribe, rate, and review our show. Your support helps us keep bringing you valuable insights on achieving fame in your industry. Keep shining and see you next time. Mm -hmm.